I think uh, a lot of you probably have a lot of questions. We only have 15 minutes, so I'm not going to ask any questions. I, I had quite a lot of questions, but I'm going to open up to the floor. So please uh, raise your hands. Tell us your name and where you're from, uh, what or what institution you represent, and then the question you want to address to. Um, my name is Lawrence Chen. I'm from the CUHK Business School. So Mr. Kwan, you mentioned a very interesting point about export of services just now. I, based on my observation, most of the Asian economies, even the more advanced ones like Japan and Korea, so they did not, my observation, they did not have a lot of success in exporting of services. They still like manufacturing, maybe a bit up uh, at the value chain. So how, how would you see the, the future of like improving the export of services from China? Because you mentioned that this would be quite crucial to the future. So even Japan, I, I'm not sure the service export takes up a big chunk of the economy. So I, I would love to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, to keep it short, uh, Hong Kong is one example you can see. We constantly run surplus in our exports. But to be honest, our model is not right for China because we focus mainly on one or two services, tourism and finance. Um, but these are the two areas also uh, China need to uh, get more. Um, service, not so much in just getting the money and getting yourself to be export qualified, but it is important for the upgrading of your industries. Increasingly, we can't differentiate manufacturing versus service these days. So in the old days, the model that we built in China is we pick up all the hardware, we train all the workers how to mend the machine, but we don't look into the software. We don't computerize as such so that the efficiency is improving across. We don't look into the environment concern uh, to provide the kind of supporting services that to make this engine work environmental friendly and energy efficient. So all these so-called services Many of those you can say as supporting for production is important for China. I don't expect China to be net service exporter. It doesn't let, uh, need to be. Uh, if every country needs to balance their external account right on, then the world is likely to be uh, <coughs> uh, have, uh, likely to have trouble. But uh, China needs the kind of service which can upgrade its economy. Uh, and to the extent that you can export your service means that your service quality is good. Otherwise, nobody is going to buy from you. Unlike in the domestic market, if you have a monopoly, you can do that. Hello, um, Jackie Wong from Hansen Bank. Um, I got a question about our Chinese economy, which I mean, everyone is very cared about, and especially about the aging population. And how do you think that uh, is that the part of the reason why they think that or uh, there is a new new normal because of the aging populations or like um, there is some other uh, reason behind or what do you think about how the aging population is going to up impact China? Uh, maybe both of you can uh, can share about that. Thank you. Okay, so so actually, so my understanding of the aging problem is from from the uh, kind of micro side, that's the firm level. That is, if you, you, you set up a company in China, originally, so major, one of the major reasons why you invest in China is a low labor cost. Why the labor cost is, is so low? Because they have a huge supply, right? So, however, the aging society issue is really a big issue due to many reasons, right? And uh, according to and the official statistics, if you still believe, right, and uh, those above, 60 years is already uh, 200 million, okay. And, and again, by using almost all the standards and criteria set by uh, different institutions, China has already entered the aging society. So this is a, a, a big issue faced by the Chinese government. So that's why probably two months or last month, right, Chinese government released the policy, the one child policy, policy okay. So implementation probably from next year, January of next year. So Chinese government see, see, saw the problem and then, then released uh, this kind of uh, policy. So uh, that's an aging problem. So on the other hand, you know, so because I know uh, some of you are from the, the uh, uh, kind of you know, foreign investors' perspectives, the, then the aging-related issues such as health, even insurance, right, probably will provide a huge opportunity for you to invest. 
right? And and uh, and by adopting different models uh, and and offering different products and, and so on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have a big question about the aging economy. First, how to define aging? Um, and in the traditional economy, age is an issue because your productivity, your your productivity and your intelligence slow down or dropped with your age. But in a technology and knowledge economy, it may not be the case. Many of the professions we have these days need more experience, need more insight, which needs time to build. Uh, and our medical situation has been improving so much. Um, 30, 40 years ago, the average age in China, I think, is 30 to 40. Now he's talking about 60, uh, 70 to 80. And I would imagine that it could be close to 100 uh, in not too distant future, but uh, not, probably not in my age anyway, too bad. So I, that is, that's an issue I want to address, but I don't think it's that important a, an issue at this point. The more important thing for China in particular is how to make it a knowledge economy and how to raise the productivity of its labor force, young and old. Uh, my name is William Lin, China Affairs Director in the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Just now, Professor Ma mentioned the Chinese government has come up with a new concept of supply side, right? So I'm curious about, I'm curious to know that both panelists' uh, interpretation on how that new supply side is going to shift the gear for China's economic growth. Thanks. Okay. So uh, new, new supply side uh, emphasis is really something, called, something really new and actually very important. So the signals are here. Like uh, last month, uh, Chinese leaders like uh, Xi Jinping and also the premier mentioned this, this, this word, that is new supply side emphasis or new supply side uh, reform, probably nine times, right? In within one month, so you know Chinese leaders, you know, seldom speak too, too much, right? However, they mentioned this, this single word or the concept for nine, nine times within one month. So sending us a strong signal that actually Chinese government is doing something on the supply side, okay? However, uh, based on my, you know, kind of study and research, I, I mean, the, the new supply side uh, reform, that is the micro level, okay, micro level. However, in the micro level, I mean, micro, that's a firm level, that is, you need to, you know, have your production plan and, and so on based on your customer's demand. So that micro side is uh, based on the demand. That's why there's a so-called internet thinking and so on, based on your customers' uh, needs and demand, then you create uh, something, or, or innovation, or production, and, 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 uh, and, and, and so on, okay? So, uh, and uh, the, in terms of effect, originally, you know, the supply, uh, the demand side in the micro level actually is, 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 is more on the, the investment uh, uh, on, on certain infrastructure and so on. Plus, uh, the, the, the supply of the uh, uh, money and, and, and so on. However, I think even from the top economists in China, when they're talking about a new, new supply side uh, uh, reform, if you check all the major points, I think it's kind of, uh, uh, return to the to the to, to the to the very basic or fundamentals that is check your demand then 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 then, then make the plan for investment and uh, also production yeah. um, <clears throat> in my days in the finance uh, industry we have uh, indus uh, a sector called fed watchers uh, nowadays we have china watchers by counting the number of works you see in a particular document uh, it helps, but doesn't necessarily lead you to a lot of insight. My reading for supply or demand side is, the world as a whole today is weak or short in demand, particularly in the industrial countries. But doesn't mean that everywhere is the same. In China's case, there are demand shortages as well as supply shortages. In a very broad sense, you can say that for those traditional sectors, industrial sectors, there are demand shortages because there's oversupply. But in the new sectors like the service sectors, in the social sectors, there are sort of supply, as I just mentioned. We're sort of schools, we're sort of uh, hospitals. So how do we balance this demand and supply and make them work to drive the economic growth is uh, another challenge. That's what I read from that. <clears throat> Fernando Diaz, um, I'm a consultant and I uh, run a company here in Hong Kong, investing in European SMEs. So um, 
The question is, is, is actually maybe, Mr. Kwan, a little bit about the Chinese corporation. How do you see Chinese corporation taking a role, uh, particularly the multinational corporation that we see investing around the world? And maybe, I don't know if you want to take the second question, was more about, uh, um, you know, is there going to be like a, a, a multi-layer economy in, in, in China, the way we have in Europe, where you have different speeds of development? And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Because when you obviously do business in China, you realize that you know Shanghai and Hunan is just different. And uh, for a foreigner, it's completely different. Uh, for a Chinese, it's very different. And I wonder whether trying to kind of level uh, everybody, like China's messaging, is a good thing or, or maybe a bad thing. And maybe there's some learnings that could be done. So those two questions, the role in the Chinese corporation and the multi-layer development, thanks. When you say multinational, I think uh, most people agree that those who can have the capability of resources to go multinational in from China is likely to be state enterprises or mega private enterprises. This is a small number of those. The good thing about that is increasingly for those who are going overseas may not be multinational, but may be just poor uh, lateral. They go to two countries or three countries, not too many. Uh, private, small private companies. From the statics, uh, statistics we have, um, maybe uh, we can verify it from the survey later, um, more and more of China's overseas direct investment these days are taken by private enterprises and small and medium size. Those, I won't say that may not qualify your multinational thing, but would be interesting and a good sign for, uh, for us to see. Uh, which implies that in China, the corporate sector has been growing in diversity, not just by state versus private, but by size and by sectors also. Okay, and also for the outward FDI of Chinese companies, uh, based on my research, and actually we found one of the major reasons for the private and small and uh, medium-sized uh, enterprise SMEs, right? And one of the major reason is uh, kind of escape to escape from the underdeveloped institutional environment in China. Then they go to uh, more advanced countries and to seek uh, 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 the resources along the value chains, right? including, of course, customers starting from the very beginning, finance and so on. So this is one of the major reasons for those Chinese private uh, SMEs to go abroad, that is to escape to, uh, the current underdeveloped. And somehow, sometimes we call it institutional uh, voice or under the developed institutional uh, environment conditions uh, within China. And the, the recent trend is, uh, you know, the, the state-owned sectors, uh, OFDIs, you know, kind of uh, slows down. Um, one of the major reasons probably is uh, uh, certain uh, corruption issues and, and, and so on, because China has tightened the auditing system for overseas uh, subsidiaries. And as a result, you know, as managers, of the SOEs, their motivation is that, you know, if we do the overseas investment and without the uh, tight control, they, you may face certain issues, right? However, if you don't do the overseas investment, you don't suffer these kind of issues. So they, 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 they take the perspective of wait and see. However, for the private SMEs, things might be different. Because in the, the economic situation is changing very fast, uh, including the Chinese uh, currency and also tightened uh, uh, loaning system and so on. So one of the major reasons for them, in addition to seeking resources market, uh, uh, the other reason uh, we found is to escape from China's underdeveloped institutional con conditions. Multilateral okay, different regions. Oh, in different, uh, in different regions. Yeah. So I think that's always a given anyway. Um, it's too. Um, I find, can't find it, but it's too overly simplified to think of a China which is growing at a certain number only, all across the country because we're talking about 9.6 million square kilometers. It's bigger than the whole Europe in landmass. So they got to be different. As I said, I, I, when I travel, I find that there are some people who have low access to anything modern for those who have all the cadets around him. So the speed 
get to be different. But the thing, the key here is that where's the trend? Are they all moving upwards faster or slower? Or are they improving or deteriorating? And how those contrasts are interacting with each other? Uh, with, with each other. I think the, the general thinking, uh, what we call as China's uh, growth miracle, economic miracle, is that never in human history we see in just say 30 years such a big landmass, so many people can improve the living standard so rapidly across the board. The Huko system, registration system, and how your thoughts on if that would make an impact on the social sector? Okay, great. That's a good question. Yeah, the Hukou system, how that would, I guess, help the urbanization, the rebalancing. Okay, so I think Hukou system, you know, you know, in China, in mainland China, almost... Maybe you need to explain what Hukou system is. Okay. The European, the okay. European Hukou actually is a kind of residence certificate. Right. If you live in this city, right, you have a certificate, certificate right, to, to show that you are actually living here. That is a Hukou system, very tight and, 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 and controlled in mainland China. So it seems like in today's, today's world, there are only two countries adopting this system. One is Korea, North Korea, the other is, is China. <laughs> right? I think the, the, one of the major reasons is, is just like you, you mentioned, is the, is the amount of speed, so different level of development in China. So, and we know that even according to McKinsey report, right, the tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four city, tier one, originally only two cities, right, uh, Beijing and, and Shanghai, now adding uh, Guangzhou and, and even Shenzhen, the four tier one cities, if you look at the housing price and, 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 and so on, right, because the large cities, larger cities has the, the power to attract almost all the assumption, uh, the, 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 the investment. Then the people living the other side, the other part of China, really want to go there to, to explore opportunities, even if it, it, they, they may suffer, right? However, with the, with the hukou system, they cannot enjoy and the same level of, of benefits, uh, uh, you know, offered by this city or this, this region. So this is the hukou system. Okay. So there is always a, a, a kind of voice in, in Chinese society saying that you know, uh, we should release this, this kind of uh, a system, right? And uh, however, uh, w there's some, some changes and, 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 uh, and, uh, in, in tier three or tier four cities. However, in the major tier one city, especially uh, the city next to Hong Kong, like uh, uh, Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, is still very tight, even tightened, even tightened. Yeah, I still remember in 1990s, mid of 1990s, if you graduate from uh, a university located in Beijing, got your bachelor degree, for sure you can have your Beijing Hukou, right? However, nowadays different. Even you got a PhD from a Beijing-based university, you cannot have a, 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 a Beijing Hukou. And 10 years ago, if you graduate from Hong Kong, uh, you know, Europe or, or, or United States, right? You, 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 you went back and as an as a overseas returnee, for sure you can catch the Hukou in Beijing, which means a lot, right? However, nowadays, things since, since have changed. So, so you can see the, lo the, the release or loosening of this kind of policy in tier four, uh, if it is tier five cities or counties, however, the tightening of this kind of uh, system in Beijing and Shanghai, so those kind of very uh, big and tier one cities. Yeah. Nicholas, anything to add? Okay. okay. Time, yeah, I, 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 so one quick question. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> when do you expect it? The ball. <laughs> okay, by IMF uh, <coughs> uh, decision to let R uh, RMB to join SDR, some people take it as the sign for convertibility already, but which is not true, of course. Um, it depends on how you define fully convertible. There's a level a dictionary tells you what and how, including the IMF itself. So. If you take it a very loose way, by cutting the capital account into a broad direct investment, portfolio investment, and other flows, there's a general uh, classification of the cap capital account. Basically, under each of these broad category, in and out, China have already allowed or loosened some venue for flows of RMB into and out, out of the country. So you can, they can claim that tomorrow or today, it is already fully convertible. 
But if your def definition of fully convertibility night, what you're using, the US dollar, Hong Kong dollar, sterling, wherever you go, what, what, by whatever means, for, for whatever reason, you can do your remittances or conversions, then my bet is you'll be very disappointed even after the official announcement of convertibility, which could be 2020 or even earlier. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>